All right, now it's my pleasure to call upon Jack Charlotte from America as well. Yeah. And then it was sort of, it turned out to be sort of a, 
a gathering of evil super friends. It was, it was a gathering of all the leaders of the right wing groups. Over here we had some neo Nazis. Over here we had the sort of the far right of the Russian Orthodox Church. The paratroopers, um, uh, various branches of the military were represented. They were all gathering for what they said was an escalation of the war. And among them was one man. Um, I ended up, so once we were there, we were there. It was, oh, great. Just so happy to be here and hear about your point of view. After four hours of their point of view, I wanted to talk to one more man, a Cossack. Um, I don't know if a Cossack sort of resonates in Singapore um, the way it does uh, if you grew up in America. Um, uh, the Cossacks were and are becoming again, um, sort of they, they were Russia's um, sort of their ethnicity, but a military ethnicity. They're ferocious fighters. Um, uh, they're, uh, famous in the um, and there was a Cossack, and he was in full 19th century dress. And I said to my translator, Tanya, um, I said, oh, we have to talk to that guy before we leave. And I didn't understand. I thought, look at his costume. He's sort of like a historical reenactor, like just people who dress up to, to do battles. Um, and I just assumed that the weapons were, you know, it was for show, uh, it was a costume. And she really didn't want to. As it turned out, she had been beaten by a Cossack at uh, an LGBT rights demonstration. Uh, but I didn't find that out until afterwards because that was not something to discuss there. So this is just a short passage about our conversation with the Cossack. The Cossack is the last man we talk to, or rather, we listen. He's a big man with sallow eyes and a mighty mustache. His head shaved on the sides and a sweep of black hair falling over his shoulders in a style traditional to Cossacks for a thousand years before Americans invented the mullet. His uniform is black with red piping, cinched at the cuffs and above his big black boots. He will begin, he says, with history. God sends Cossack souls through our blood, he says, in a voice that seems cultivated for menace, a barrel of dread. God sends Cossacks, yes, he says. They have always been his warriors. They took up the cross before Russia, and they carried it forth with a whip and a sword, and they could not be beaten. The Soviets tried, but it could not be done. And now, in Vladimir Putin, there is a leader who loves them, and the Cossacks are rising. Do not be frightened, the Cossack across from us says. Cossacks are just. For instance, we will not rape Muslim women, for it would be unjust to the half Cossack child who would be born damned. <laughs> and, yet, we are creative. We are famous for our humor. For instance, homosexualism, homosexualism, it's an ideology, is a war against Cossacks, so by right, homosexuals should be slaughtered. This is tradition. He recounts some of the ways Cossacks kill homosexuals, historically speaking. Of course, I cannot say this officially. He cracks his first smile. But there is something he can speak of. Shit, the primary medium of Cossack humor. They like to put their cocks in the ass, so we put the shit on their cocks for them. They put the shit on their whole bodies, in fact. We smear them, he says. He chortles, waits for me to laugh, glares. Do I not think this is funny? I try to change the subject. Tell me about your outfit, I say quietly. <laughs> he shows me his whip, weighted with a sharp lead block. He puts his thick wooden grip in my hand. Feel, he says. He unsheathes a wide black blade as long as my forearm. He says nothing about the gun at his side. What kind of gun is that, I ask. A good one, he says. <laughs> he releases the clip to show me it's loaded. He pushes the clip back in. He points the gun at me, very casual, just in my direction. Cossack humor. Do I not think this is funny? I lift my notebook off the table. He reaches across to thumb it down. Peachy, he says. Right. There is more that must be recorded. More justice, more jokes. Now it's going to get a little dark. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is actually uh, a piece that, um, for my first book, I decided to go back to an old piece. This is a piece that was written kind of in response to Chuck Bogan's book of Isaiah for a book called The Heretic's Bible, where uh, 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 a friend of novelist Peter Manso and I decided to recreate uh, the Bible, asking um, some of our friends and writers that we admired 
uh, uh, to reinterpret books of scripture and we took for ourselves the book of Psalms, basing it on a year of travel around the United States. Um, uh, I should say this is all nonfiction. I, I don't I hope that's clear. Um, the genre sometimes known as creative nonfiction. I hate that term. Sometimes known as literary journalism. I'm trying to get people to call it new journalism because that's what it feels like to me. Be patient, a hybrid, uh, using the techniques of fiction uh, to tell stories we did in fact. Um, this was one of our songs. Uh, we wrote, I should say, this is collective first person. Uh, we decided we each wrote our own chapters, our own songs. Uh, but we decided to sort of erase particular authorship. Um, every, uh, every piece that we wrote together in the book is me. This is in Broward County, Florida. Are you a preacher? Johnny DeCosta might have asked that night. The lilt of Jamaica in her voice is much of an enticement as the curves of her hips and her breast. And Lucius Boyd, a preacher of sorts, with a smile. My daughter was a virgin, Donna's mother tell, told us three years later. It wasn't an assertion, it was an accusation. How could the Lord take an innocent? How could the Lord take one who had not yet been blessed by love? God's will. She spat the words out and ground them into the floor. We sat silent, staring at them. We'd come to the southern tip of Florida looking for Santeria, the Cuban religion of African gods doubling as Catholic saints, of chicken bones and love candles and dope blood on the street outside the INS building every morning. Prayers to the situation. Prayers to the Virgin Mary and her Yoruba alter ego, Ochen, to let a brother or a sister or a daughter come to the promised land. Instead, we had found Donna's mother. She didn't need candles. She didn't need chicken bones. All she wanted was blood. A virgin, not his mother said. Lord, how she felt. She spoke of the last time she had seen her daughter alive before Donya left for church one Friday night three years ago. Are you a preacher? Donya might ask. And Lucius Boyd's reply, she would have noted the air condition of his tone, his long American vowels. Yes, I am a preacher, he might have answered. And from what the witnesses tell us about the dark skinned girl who climbed into a church van, with a light-skinned man, how she wavered before getting in as if on the edge of faith, we know she was excited and afraid. Faith is dangerous. Friday night, 2 a.m., Dawn just now coming home from church, Faith Tabernacle Pentecostal United, a church of Caribbean exiles making good in America. She's a big girl, handsome, known for her bright laughter and her powerful lungs. She loves Jesus, she loves her church. Friday night, nowhere else she'd rather be. She's 21, going to be a nurse, so God-fearing she won't even wear slacks. But she loves to party, loves to sing. She's an alto, she sings solos. Friday night, her throat is itching. She wants to let it loose. She wants to pray. She wants to sing. She has the solo. There's power, power, wonder-working power, power in the blood of the land. It's a song, it's a prayer, it's a vibration in her bones. The clock creeps into the morning. The choir the camps to a diner where they drink coffee and laugh and laugh about life back in the islands, and then they shift to the parking lot, short bursts of song escaping their lips between goodbyes like hiccups of gospel. Donya gets behind the wheel, alone with her solo. She cruises through the warm, dark Florida morning, her windows down while she sings. There's power in the blood. Her voice shakes the car so hard she doesn't notice it's sputtering, and then it rolls to a stop. She's run out of gas. Faith is dangerous. Donya walks down the highway in the dark. Cars goes by, nobody stops, just as well. She keeps company with the Lord. She sings to keep herself safe. There's power in the blood, power, power, wonder-working power. She comes to a ramp, exits the highway on foot, walks out of the dark into the white light of the gas station. She sees a turquoise van, a church van, a generation of hope written on its side. In it is a man with broad shoulders and dark eyes. They spot her wandering, and he rolls up beside her. His eyebrows are raised, his lips are set in a careless smile. Are you a preacher, Don, you might ask? The man will laugh. No, not really, but he does give sermons at the funeral home he runs with his family. He's a businessman, but solace is his trade. Isn't that about the same thing? Don, he gets in the van. Faith is dangerous. 3 a.m., Don, is gone. Her mama's awake. She wants her daughter. Dawn and her eldest, Dawn and her strongest. She is physically strong, her mother told us, sitting in her beauty parlor between a pawn shop and a gun store, making a fist out of her daughter's strength. She's always with me, she said. 
Three years later, she still saw Donya nodding to Lucia's boy's pious words. Felt her daughter's shoulders tensing as he drove past her car without slowing down. Heard her pray, oh my God, help me. As his hands pushed her down to the floor of the church van, Jesus help me. As his face came above like the maw of an animal, God, as he tore into a leg and beast himself. Please, I pray for him to suffer, Donya's mother said. May the Lord make that so. Donya's church prayed with her. Let him suffer, they prayed. A chorus of anger so deep it didn't so much stain their faith as transform it. Even before they knew his name, the day they found Don his body, naked, raped, stabbed, run over, and oddly, tenderly, wrapped in a shroud of bed sheets, they prayed for him. The day the police caught him, they prayed for him. Every day of Lucius Boyd's trial, they sat in the back of the courtroom and prayed for him. The day the jury said guilty, they prayed for him. And now, the Sunday after the verdict, a new holiday they called Victory Day. They prayed for him. Let him suffer. Thank you, Jesus. Give him the chair. Thank you, Jesus. Make him lead. Thank you, Jesus. They wore a prayer in a red dress, a red suit, red suspenders. It's the color of Jesus' blood, said the Reverend of Faith Tabernacle, as if that explained why he and his church had chosen it as a special color of their celebration. <coughs> Today we're celebrating Jesus, the congregant said. Today we're wearing red for justice. Red is the color of their prayer. Red is the color of blood. And there's power in the blood, and that's what they say. A choir 45 strong at the front of the church, the band bursting out of its corner, the women in the pews sizzling in their seats until like popcorn, they hopped into the air. Thank you, Jesus. That's an S like a Z, Jesus. That's a red bloody Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. A boy in a black suit over a red shirt, with his hands in the air, and then his fingers fluttered like butterflies until the spirit filled them, and they turned into talons. There is power in the blood. The soulless wore a red skirt suit and a red hat shaped like that of a pilgrim. There is power, she sang. Power, power, power. From somewhere in the choir wall, tambourines rose up and rippled across the singers like a school of silver fish. The drummer banged his way past the plexiglass shield designed to contain him. The piano player, a teenage boy, splashed across the keys as if skipping stones on water. Two rows ahead, a tall man with a heavy jaw and thin frame of an undertaker rocked back and forth, his arms glued to his sides, his hands like paddles. Then the bass simmered, the choir quieted, the river preached. She has been justified. He was the biggest man in the church, his legs alone taller than the full height of a boy, his head as wide and thick as the mouth of a cannon, his words shaped like an Englishman's. My God, he said, we can rejoice. Later, we would sit with him in his office, lost in deep leather chairs, strained to see him behind the bronze eagle that swooped from a pedestal over his neat pile of sermons. His God, he said, was a loving one, and his love was like a lion, like a fighter plane. The Reverend loved fighter planes. He loved his new country's F-16s. Do you understand? He asked us, one hand in a fist pressed against the black marble of his desk, the other stroking its sheen. What this nation, under God, can do to God's enemies? If we hadn't before, we did then, under the anger of the Reverend's glare. In the pulpit, the Reverend Lord has adopted American creed. You can run, but you can't hide, his congregation shouted. Let us sing, the Reverend commanded. The soul shook her head hard, and her red pilgrim hat punched the air. In her hand, there was suddenly a red handkerchief like a splash of blood. We won, she said. Red scarves burst into the air and around the church like so many gunshots. We won, we won, we won. In the front row, a half a dozen white men, detectives, and a prosecutor, special guests for Victory Day, nodded their heads. They knew this song. The lead singer pumped her hands. We won the war, we won the war. We won the war. Yes, said the Reverend. Yes. The choir subsided, folded up in a twitching quiet and wings behind his shoulders. Did we not know it would be so? The guitar player twanged, warned, played the blues. The wise man Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days. Yes, the congregation shouted with joy. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, tell us! screamed a woman in the back pew. St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The congregation roared, Jesus, and does it not say, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, 
Oh yes, the congregation said, women crying and men dancing. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, for whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. A flurry of keyboard and a burst of rumbling bass followed the words. The reverend waited. He looked at the pews, his congregation of exiles and immigrants, Jamaicans and Antigua, with their skin so dark, their souls, he believed, so white. The reverend did not know what it meant to be black, he said, until he came to this country. He wished not to know. He was not black, he said. He was a man, just like he had told us, especially like he told us the white man who filled the first pew, the detectives, the prosecutor, these powerful men who had listened to the power of the Lord, heard the power of faith tabernacle. The reverend stared at the white man. I am well pleased, he said, with what God has done, with what God is about to do. Isaiah! A man in the back shouted his prophet's name. The reverend ignored him. I will say now that we have the blessing of dignitaries among us. The white men shifted in their seats. These men, said the reverend, who have done, he paused, so much. I have not seen one flaw in these men. If it exists, I am not looking. I have not seen one such flaw, such as racism. The prosecutor nodded. The man in the back again shouted his prophet's name. Isaiah! Like a bullet fired at the altar. What did he mean? Nobody cared. Why did people say the sheriff shot black people as if they were dogs? Nobody knew. Why didn't they put Lucius Boyd away when they thought he'd killed a black prostitute? That didn't matter. What mattered was power. The power of prayer. The power of blood. The power of faith tabernacle to make white men do their will. The guitar thrummed and the red handkerchiefs waved. At the reverend's invitation, the prosecutor stepped up to the pulpit. He was nearly as big as the reverend, with dark hair going silver, boyish cheeks, narrow set eyes and being concerned, and teeth, bright white teeth. I'm seeing a whole lot of red out there, he shouted. The guitar leapt up behind him. Can you hear me? He called. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. He reminded them that he had been there before campaigning two years ago, he didn't even know what church he was in, when the reverend had pointed a finger at him and demanded, what are you going to do? Only then did I realize I was in Don Costa's church. And when I knew that I came up, I, you remember, I came up to the pulpit and I said, I will do everything in my power to make sure justice is done. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And in return, I asked, well, one thing. What was that? Oh, Lord, justice. The prosecutor, who would not comment on his plans to run for higher office, who was a lector in his Catholic church, the racial mix of which he told us he had never noticed, who loved hockey and his two children and his wife, none of whom he had brought that morning to Faith Tabernacle, who said there were no bad parts of his town. The prosecutor asked for one thing. Votes? No, no. Your thoughts and your prayers. Power in the blood resumed, the red habit woman belting, we got it, we got it, we got it. A woman in the second row of the choir let her long hair fly as she slammed her torso backwards and forwards like a wet rag snapping. The detectives danced, hips and shoulders this way and then that. And despite ourselves, we did too, even though it made us feel like accomplices. Two more lightning rods with the power of faith tabernacle meant to draw down from the sky and up from the grave. We got it, whether we wanted it or not. Though what it was, we couldn't say. They'd already had deliverance, that's how they'd come to America. And they were certain each and every one of them was saying, what did they want? Not chicken bones, not candles, and not a creamy white price bleeding. Forgive! They wanted blood. To get it, they needed power. We got it! We got it! They needed the DA who stacked their young men up in jails like piles of sugar cane. We got it! They had it, and now the DA felt it, the power they had. We could see it in the way his bones seemed to shake free of their joints, and the way his bright white teeth sparked electric. As Faith Tabernacle anointed him, old women running up to him, young men seizing him, the choir singing for him, the pastor smiling at him. He gave his smile back to the pastor. It was as though both would later claim. There was no more black and white between them, just red. A wave of it that could take Lucius Floyd to the chair, the prosecutor to the judge's bench, and the reverend to a brand new marble pulpit. Lucius Floyd didn't say a word in a sentence in here a few days later. Nice to see you, Mr. Boyd, the judge said. Lucius Boyd simply nodded. We sat in Elizabeth's gallery ten feet away. He had sleepy eyes and a broad jaw, a face that spread out like an alluvial plain, handsome but tired. 
His skin was as gray as it was brown. Every day of the trial, he wore a new suit, but now he wore a prison issue, a prison issue coverall with age. It rounded his shoulders and made his chest look hollow, but still he smiled, even for the prosecutor, just as he had smiled at the reverend. But the reverend had sat in that gallery, praying for justice and power and blood. Why not? They had won the war, but that one was spoils. Lucius was a preacher himself. He knew the cost of the covenant. He knew a deal had been struck on the foundation of his body. Over his bones, the reverend and the prosecutor would not just shake hands, but bind themselves together in order to build a bright red temple. Sentenced to death, Lucius Boyd would never hear his choir, nor would Donnie's mother. I don't need that church no more, she told us when we went to a beauty party and sat in an empty room behind the styling chairs lit by cold blue fluorescent bulbs. She had hated victory day. As far as she was concerned, power and the blood belonged to Donya. And she had hated the things people had sent her with there. People say God used Donya as a sacrifice. People say God used her to kill Lucius. She paused for a moment too angry to speak. But people use God in a wrong way. Thank you. Thank you, Dad.